hello and welcome back everybody. Dan John here from danjohnuniversity.com. This is episode 130 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. And it's nice to see us ticking them away. Uh, we're doing this a couple of years now. I've enjoyed it and the questions seem to get better every week. Uh, remember, if you have questions, uh, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. And I'm, I'm happy to answer every question that comes in and let's get started today shall we uh the question the first couple of questions are a little different a little interesting so uh i hope you like them uh first one uh and it says a question from dan and this is pointed to me with a lifetime of experience in the world of strength and conditioning if you were to go back and speak to yourself at 30 years of age what advice would you try to give conversely Knowing what you were like at 30 years of age, do you think you would have been so receptive to your own advice? Well, geez. Um, so, I mean, I had to do a little math. I had to think about what year that would have been. Uh, it was a while ago. It was in the late 80s. And, you know, I didn't have kids yet. You know, Kelly wouldn't show up until I was 32. But uh, when I trained uh, in 87, I trained way too hard. In 87, I read uh, something that Terry ta Terry and Jan Todd had put together about this four-month uh, training idea where you did lots and lots of high reps the first month, 20, two sets of 20, 25. The next month was sets of 15 to 12. The third month was like eights and tens, and the fourth month was a deload. And uh, I remember sliding over that because I was just beating myself senseless um, and I, I was trying all kinds of things. I was working with uh, a good friend of mine with some, you know, we had kind of, he had kind of come up with this interesting little ab exercise. We called it the Morgan ab drill or Morgan ab exercise. Really, it was just you push your lower back into the ground as hard you can. And you do these tiny little crunches like that, you know, to help my lower back. Because I was having some back problems from all the years of discus throwing and Olympic lifting. I think I would have listened to me especially if I packaged it um, as I'm about to package it for you. Uh, the thing I wasn't doing enough of at the time, and this has been a weakness <laughs> for, uh, probably um, the decade before that too, I needed to do more hill sprints, uh, stadium steps, uh, hill runs, uh, those kinds of things. I needed to do a lot more of it. So one or two days a week, I, would, I should have done more. Now, interesting, with when I was in my... It would have been in my later 30s. I started doing hill sprints again, and I got this nice little burst. Obviously, at uh, in 1987, I wasn't doing um, loaded carries. Uh, I think just the suitcase carry alone. I, I would like to say I would have understood it, but with what I know now, I have enough research to back it up and all those other things, you know, Stu McGill and everything. But, um, yeah, the suitcase carry, the farmer walk was great for coaching. Uh, the farmer walk is, was wonderful for coaching. But for my own progress, the suitcase case carry was better. It's not bad or good. It's just in my own case. So, okay, so hill sprints, uh, suitcase carries. Um, with the Olympic lifts, I would really, uh, I have a note in a, I think it's 1993, all I need to do is lift weights three days a week. And I didn't have yet the transformation program. I didn't even have the big 21 program yet. I wouldn't pick those up for another four or five years. But I would try to start Olympic lifting just the three days a week. And really, um, you know, wow, I, I, honestly, it'd be wonderful. Gosh, it would have been wonderful if I'd have had the easy strength template there. Huh? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? So... Clean and press, three sets of three. Snatch, three sets of three. Clean and jerk, maybe three singles. Front squats, honestly, two sets of two. Suitcase carry, um, two days a week do the hill sprints. The other days of the week, just do my discus drills. There's another whole area that I didn't, I didn't do any discus drills that, back then. Everything was just throw, 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 throw. My workouts lasted forever. And I never improved because the bulk of the time I was training, I wasn't really, um, I mean, I was, it was, I was walking or, or running back and forth, getting the disc, the discus, the disc guy, um, 
it was just not a good thing. Uh, interesting, about a decade later, when we started throwing against that wall, uh, my throws increased. So, so yeah, I, I think I would have been receptive, especially with the clarity that I now have. I, I would be adding things that he'd want to hear, taking away a few things that he would mostly go, okay, yeah, sure, I'll try this. But the 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 new tool, the 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 emphasis on the hill sprints, the on the suitcase carry, it could have been any loaded carry, doesn't matter. Um, the three day a week training where you you get in, you never miss. That was something I wasn't very good at at the time. Uh, those kinds of things would have worked out well. Um, it was a, it was a, my thirties thirties was you know thirties is when I became a father and you know a full time teacher and working two jobs. It was it was a hard time, you know. Um, and what I would be telling him, even though he didn't know it yet, is I'm going to save you a lot of time. So really, it'd be an, <laughs> I'd love to see him do easy strength for fat loss with Olympic lifting, the worst title of an exit thing I ever did uh, in his deep off season. And uh, um, so three days a week of doing that. And one day a week, probably taking hills seriously, whatever that meant, and then seeing if I can get more walking. And that was a huge mistake I made back then. I never walked. I mean, I walked, but I didn't take it uh, like I take it now. Would I have listened? I think so. Um, um, I was actually, I mean, I can remember in 1987, so on my 30th uh, year, uh, going up to see Coach Mon, who would who would be retiring, uh, he retired uh, in the 1988 season. So yeah, I'd have been there for that. Um, and sitting down with Coach Mon, uh, and, and I just asked him to go over. I mean, here I was, his MVP, his, you know, he, he once said that I was the finest thrower in the history of Utah State, which... I gotta tell you, folks, that is really high praise, and uh, and I and I sat down with him and I said, "Can you go over everything?" And I got the notes uh, in one of my journals somewhere, and just having him go through these things, and everything he said was so simple. Um, he was he I overtrained, and that was always my mistake. You know, he was real big about you lift weights three days a week, you throw four, and I kept trying to lift weights twenty times a week and throw a thousand, and it wasn't right. Uh, I would have thrown more against the wall. I would have done more drills as a thrower. But I was, I think I was receptive. And Dan, thank you for that question. It's a good question. Uh, I like it. You know, uh, easy strength for fat loss with Olympic lifting. It might be the best, some of the best stuff I've ever put together. And uh, gentle listeners who don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it too much. <clears throat> but uh, one example is that you know, clean and clean and press, three sets of three, squat snatch, three sets of three, clean and jerk, couple of singles, couple of front squats, suitcase carry, go for a walk. And it, it can be that simple. Uh, you know, mix it up with, you know, do that for three weeks and then throw the ab wheel instead of the suitcase carry and then, you know, just toss in things to see how they work. It don't don't work too hard thinking about it. Um I think easy strength for fat loss for Olympic lifting might be the best thing you could ever do as a discus thrower. And uh, that's, and it, it, that would be something um, I, I would like to have shared with him. So thank you. Great question. I appreciate it. Uh, on a follow-up and very close to this, and, and, and again, a very kind uh, statement here. Uh, Jeff says, you have been an athlete, academic, educator, administrator, coach, writer, fitness, professional, Instagram sensation, oh yes, etc. Do you have any advice for people looking to have eclectic careers while prioritizing family and community? So just for the record, I did ask my daughter about this. And I said, hey, this, this is an interesting question from this guy. And so I talked to her for a while and she gave me some feedback. So here we go. I know that's a lot, but there are really... Uh, are all really of one piece to me. It seems like 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 doing it while remaining healthy, for example, sleeping, is going to be a challenge. So yeah, so when you have when you're trying to like for example, most of my uh, most of the time my daughters have been alive. I would say, and when I mean most, I'd say ninety nine percent of the time, 
I've had two careers at the same time, either as an administrator and a professor or as a uh, high school coach and a professor or a professor and a professor in two different schools. Uh, writer, a fitness celebrity. <laughs> Somebody called me a fitness celebrity. I thought that was kind of funny because, yeah. Well, how do you balance it? For one thing, and I'm going to tell you from the heart, Jeff, um, you know, I've got that goal setting course over at the Dan John University, and there's there's some things in there that really, I've been doing a lot of the tools for a long time. In fact, just before I got on this, I, I ordered two books. I didn't know Earl Nightingale had written these two books, and I understand they're compendiums, so maybe they, you know, they took all of his articles and smushed them. Doesn't matter. I haven't listened to Earl since what, well my 20s and I you know so I went out and bought a new book but there's there's some things in goal setting goal achievement um, success uh, authors that have helped me immensely so the things that help me the most is that there's the first one is that five two assignments well what do you want to be doing two decades from now two years from now two months from now and then today and tomorrow and from there, I build out the pirate maps. I build out the shark habit stuff. I think that stuff helped me because what it, I mean, I've been goal setting my whole life. So it's, it, it's just normal for me. But when I goal set with a vision of two, two decades, 20 years, um, it always includes grandchildren and children and, you know, neighbors. And it, but then my vision gets much more broad when I think 20 years down the line, when, oh, when I'm in my mid eighties or whatever. And it, it changes the way I address things and look at things. So having that, just if you just did it, what do I want to be like two decades from now and two years from now, just that conversation and look at it, you know, your finances, look at it, your, your body and you seem to already nailed that one. Uh, you said family and community, look at the, all those things. Um, and what you'll find is that you'll realize that if you decide to have a short-term answer now, you decide to go on massive amount of drugs and you're going to take all these amphetamines, you're going to do all this other stuff, you know, lose a, you lose 20 pounds in the next, you know, five weeks to, to look good, you know, on the beach. When you step back and look 20 years from now, it's like, okay, that's just five weeks. I, you know, that's, how can I keep doing that? And it's, it's real hard to keep doing amphetamines for 20 years. Uh, I don't have any personal knowledge. I was just, I'm just, just thinking so and then once you go through that kind of thing the the, the five two assignment you, you think about your long-term goals and what you want to be like and what you want and the kind of home you want and I think you have to be clear I mean uh, do you want a bedroom for every child do you want a bathroom for every child or do they have to share bathrooms well if they share bathrooms then you're gonna have a whole bunch of other issues downstream which is fine it's all good as long as you're ready for it um, start, you know, uh, uh, I often shop with 20 years later in mind, you know, when I buy this, you know, how long, you know, I've got some kind of, there's a couple things. In fact, as I'm looking on top of my desk here, I'm like, yeah, I, that's good. I, that's kind of cool. I'll keep that. And then it's like the thing next to it's like, why do I have that? And, you know, sometimes you have to say, well, you, you got it. Cause it was, it's a good memory, which is just fine. Um, so when you start to have the vision of long-term, it does change a few things. Uh, that That's always helped me. And then from there, the thing that really helped me the most, and I, I wasn't very good about it in, when I was younger, but now I am, is now I try to focus at one time on two numerical goals. So the one I'm focusing on for body weight is weighing uh, 211, 96 kilos. So every day I write out some ideas about how to get my body weight down there and keep my Olympic lifting abilities up. You know, so, I mean, obviously that ties into a lot of things like sleep. And like you mentioned, uh, I've got to take sleep more seriously. I was at the Korean market about a week ago and the nice lady, cause I, I think I, I'm, I'm probably her biggest customer, not her biggest fan, but her largest customer. And she knows I like this special kind of uh, kimchi and uh, she put some stuff aside for me. She goes, this is a, and she uh, got me uh, a Korean bamboo a pillow for me and she gave it to me for five bucks i don't know if that's a good deal or not i have no idea but she told me because we one time we talked about meditating and she felt that when you meditate you it, it helps to have the head a certain way 
So I've been trying out this new pillow. Don't, don't worry about getting the right one. The idea though, I take meditation very simple. I got that weird mask I wear and it's got the Bluetooth and the earphones and it's got, now I got the special neck thing and uh, I have a little apaka, apalka, um, related to the llama. It's a, it's a fur thing I put on my body when I, when I meditate. So I'll stay cool and warm at the same time. That's how it works with me. And then I have brain.fm and I listen to a specific, uh, uh, relaxation tape that I, it's funny. I think you would think you would, you would memorize it, but, but, but you don't. And so I guess what I'm saying is find the things that you think are be important and then spend quality time, time, treasures, talent to, to make sure you set it up. Well, um, you might, I mean, I'm sure I have listeners with children who say, I don't have a 15 minute period every day where I can just meditate. And I would say, yeah, I get that because I was the same way. So what I did is uh, I wake up 15 minutes earlier than I used to and I start my day meditating because I read somewhere that if you fall asleep meditating, it means you're just tired. You're not really getting the benefits of what meditation is. And meditation is a practice where you consciously turn everything down. Well, uh, so now I get up, uh, I mean, I wake up, I take a few minutes to change gear so I can meditate. Um, usually I have to pee. Um, and then I meditate, and then at the norm, my normal waking time, gosh, I've already knocked down one of the, I guess, the five things I try to do every day. Um, so this this my pirate map, you know. Before I go to bed at night, I make my to-do list for the next day. I take my supplements or whatever, or whatever I'm taking, uh, you know, like sugar-free Metamucil. And, uh, I take a hibernate, which is a sleep medicine that I, I uh, not sleep medicine, a sleep formula that I like. That's kind of about it, I think. Oh, I take vitamin D. And I take those. So I do my to-do list. I take those. I try to wind down. And because I, I really want, because I find doing my to-do list makes my, makes me sleep better. I wake up and I meditate. Uh, a relaxation meditation, a breathing relaxation meditation. Um, I fast until I work out. I work out. After I work out, uh, I go for a walk. After I get, I finish my walk, I try to eat a meal that's really heavy in uh, vegetables, kimchi, uh, vegetables, fermented foods, and some protein. And uh, that's that's how I do things. Um, so the more structured. <laughs> It's funny because I get the kimchi at the at the Korean market. And so the more structured you have things, the easier it is to stay along. I, I know I rambled. I hope it helped. Uh, I really, I liked your question, and that's how I do it. Um, the internet stuff, the internet sensation you called me, that's just me sharing information because I love to share information. Um, I, I like helping people. And uh, when people say mean things about me, I even try to help them. <laughs> so, I don't know. Hope that helps. Great question. Thank you so much. So, we have a question from Ryan. And Ryan says this. It's a little long, uh, but I think it's worth our time. Um, so, let's go. I was listening to your recent podcast episode with Chip Conrad. Chip is a great guy. In which you discussed the life and legacy of Tommy Kono, the great Olympic lifter and uh, Mr. Universe. Wonderful conversation. I couldn't help lighting up at your remarks about Tommy's emphasis on lat and glute development as signs of athletic pro prowess. That is, the ass is the real core, which I still, I think is, you know, genius, yeah. I've since done more reading and listening to Tommy. Uh, there are some videos in his lectures. Yeah. YouTube's wonderful, and found them fascinating. I was curious whether you see any value in the idea of accentuating, accentuating, sorry about that, folks, lats and glutes in a Dan John hypertrophy training context. Push, pull, hinge, squat, carry. I know Brett Contreras is a big advocate of progressively loading the hip thrust and that you already speak a great deal about the value of vertical pulling. Would you, for instance, add a weighted hip thrust to the mix which is what we do in my gym, yeah. Or do you think the deadlift squat uh, provide enough glute development? 
I really wish you, uh, Ryan, you would listen to one of my workshops uh, when I talk about the movement matrix. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, the course on my site, uh, Advanced Easy Strength Topics, goes over all this. But, you know, I wouldn't, so for me, you know, we're going to do a workout. You're going to come on my place. It's Tuesday, so Tuesday's buns and guns. You're going to do hip thrust, goblet squat, deficit deadlift in little circuits, maybe ab wheel on top because the ab wheel is a lat. It's, the ab wheel is a lat workout. In fact, the ab wheel is one of the best ways to build your pull-up up. So, yeah, I think, so, yeah, so obviously right now I'm Olympic lifting a lot. So when I Olympic lift, um, I got to tell I'm glad you said this because it was just days ago that I talked to one of the people I trained with and I said, let's make sure I get the glute loop out and I do my hip thrust and my clamshells because as an Olympic lifter, I think you need levels of glute conditioning, you know, um, you know, you get tired. I, you'll see this with some of my Olympic lifter friends as when they get tired, they, they their posture goes into a really weird place. And, uh, in there, cause they're, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of squats and a lot of snatches, a lot of cleans, you know, you're trying to save yourself and your posture kind of turns into a little bit of a comma, which is something I don't think you want. So yeah, I, I, I very much think it's okay to do a, a hypertrophy buns and guns is a hypertrophy butt workout and a hypertrophy arm workout. And the other days a week we do squat and deadlift and things like that. So I think you're right on here. Uh, I know we're talking about aesthetics here, but I'm just curious about how you might approach this from a stand, standpoint of exercise selection and programming, even if it's only as a thought experiment. I already did the thought experiment for you, Ryan. Um, if you really want a lot more, just find any of my, even in my bounce workshops, you'll find those on the YouTube site. I go into this some, uh, but I yeah, I agree with you. And I have... Um, When you're talking about the glute, I think you got to be careful about saying hypertrophy or strength or power because I the, the glute is such a big engine and the lats too that you need all kinds of reps and set schemes to get the best and the best out of all of it for you. Um, the glute is one of the, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you could build up a superstar if they are born right with just like, I don't know, deadlifts or front squats, you know, that's it. That's just the one exercise. But for the bulk of us, I think you need a mix. Uh, not just a mix of exercises, but a mix of reps and sets too. Thank you. Great question. A really great question. We have a question from Mark. Mark says, I'm 40 in pretty decent shape considering old rugby injuries and two kids work, etc. I'm currently in a situation where I can I have only access to one bell, 32K, comfortably swing it for sets of 25 to give you an idea of the conditioning level. Sets so of 25 with the 32, that's that's good effort. There's nothing wrong with that. What are the pros and cons of utilizing the 10,000 swings concept, but with lower reps to accommodate the additional weight? What impacts would it expect to see positive or negative? Well, the only thing is, Mark, just keep in mind that the 10,000 swing challenge is just a challenge. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine that if you did the 500 swings a day with the 32 at the end of the 20 days, you know, something good would happen. Your grip, you know, especially I find that weird right, right there. That is my kettlebell swing muscle. I don't know what, I don't know what it is, but it's, that's the one that gets the, that's the one when I'm at the end of the day going, what happened? Uh, I do notice my posture gets better after it. And I do notice and, you know, maybe one or two people have you know, said that I have a lovely buttocks and that gives me great joy. Um, you ask pros and cons. The pros would be you would have a very clear 20-day path. And don't underestimate that. For 20 days, you're going to say, this is what I'm going to do. Wish me luck. Hats off. We'll see you in a bit. Cons. Well, I mean, old rugby injuries, two kids work. You know, and then you're going to throw in the swings. Uh, it might be worth you doing something that I've never done. Now, we do have group the group workouts. But dropping it to just 250 swings a day, which will, 
you know, it's going to double the amount of time it's going to take. But do 250 swings a day and mix in, especially if you're going to do just sets of 25. So do a set of 25, do a push. Do a set of 25, do an upper body mobility move. Do a set of 25, do a pull. Do a set of tw 25 and do an upper body uh, mobility move. Do a set of 25 and goblet squat if you can. Do a set of 25 and do a lower body mobility movement. Do a set of 25 and do... I'm getting lost. A lower body mobility movement. So hip flexor stretch followed by his. Do 25 swings and do maybe walking in place, suitcase carries, 25 swings, you know. So swing, uh, traditional lift, swing. And by the way, if you only have the 32 and that's all, um, if you can't, you know, press it left hand, then right hand. Um, row left, row right. You know, do that, you know. So 25 swings, left hand press. 25 swings, right hand press. 25 swings, upper body mobility, 25 swings, uh, left hand row, 25 swings, right hand row, you know, you know something like that. Um, and it, once you write it out, it'll be a lot more logical. Um, and then that way, you're getting these full body workouts in, plus your swings, and it'll give you time to do the mobility and the strength work that we all need. If you just want to do and this is not a bad idea considering you talk about your injuries right away. 25 swings, appropriate. I would do, a, we do original strength, Tim Anderson's work. 25 swings, a Tim Anderson movement. 25 swings, Tim Anderson movement. 25, 25. And do 10 rounds of that. You might feel better walking out the door. You might even find a yoga move or two that help. Um, for me personally, there's two yoga moves. One's called the rag doll. And uh, I really, I hinge my butt back, way back, so I'm not just hanging on my, uh, my tissues. Uh, I have some, so I push my butt way back, I hinge, grab my elbows like this and just hang. And almost every time I do that, I hear my neck go, and do this like, not a pop like a chiropractor adjustment, but like a real opening. And then I wait until I hear my lower back do the same thing. And then the other one I do is called the butterfly. It's where you sit on your back, you put the, your heels together, and you just let your legs open up. Um, because of all my hip issues, that makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. <laughs> well, so maybe you can find a few simple exercises that uh, work for you and your injury history. But uh, Mark, you're doing fine. And I'm, I'm glad. I, I hope I helped. Thank you. We have a question from Ian. Ian, he says, I was hoping you could go more into your heavy hands work and long walks after your lifting. For your heavy hands work, you mentioned you use the dumbbells and ankle weights, but you do not, but do you do anything more complicated than the simple pump and walk as Dr. Schwartz introduces for beginner heavy handers during your walks? Okay, I love Leonard Schwartz, the, the late Leonard Schwartz. I love him. But hey, ain't no way I'm going to be doing that stuff in public, okay? No, I'm not going to do aerobic dance medleys. I walk like this. I have my ankle weights on, which are great because of my legs. Uh, that's I got to be careful about that. Today I used uh, heavy hands, three pounds each, 30-pound um, weight pack, and that was it. I had no ankle weights on. Um you know, in hindsight, I actually should, probably should have worn them, but I didn't. Um, I love, I, I am shocked that if you have the three pound weights, uh, one and a half kilo, two kilos in hand, and don't, don't lose your mind, stay lighter. If I'm walking like this and have a vest, if I'm walking like this and have ankle weights, by the time, even in, uh, I don't know if you know, Met, uh, so we walk about, uh, three kilometers every day for sure, uh, you know, uh, sneaking up on two miles every day for sure. Uh, some days, I've, I've gone as long as 10 in a day. That was crazy. Uh, I just, I was, it was just weird. It was that weird kind of tired where you're not like tired, tired, but all you want to do is eat and sit down 
you know, it's that weird kind of, okay, I'm done, you know. Um, so no, I just do the, I just do the pump and walks. Uh, I don't go very high. Sometimes as a joke, we'll do it, but most of the time I'm here. I'm about here and I try to stride along with it. Okay. Um, in the books, he brings out various other movements like lateral raises, punches, little kicks. And I'm curious if you've tried these movements, found valuable. Um, we were doing lateral raises for a long time and, uh, we just stopped. Uh, I, I just think the heavy hands pump and walk are all you need. But I, if you like it, do it. And you know, um, you know, once the weather starts to improve here, and once I can get back into the mountains, I can do a lot more stuff in the mountains with all the trees around uh, than I do in my neighborhood here in Murray. I mean, I live in a respectable place for God's sakes. <laughs> um, finally, how long is long when you're talking about your walks? Uh, every day, at least a half an hour. Um, I prefer more like 45 minutes, but you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta live what you live. Uh, weekends, I try to get at least one, one hour walk in. Yesterday's was just delightful. Um, I was supposed to meet up with my daughter at the ice house and uh, I said, okay. And I looked at the little thing and said, oh, I'll be there. And I walk for an hour to, on the way there and I realized that I was going to be late because it was so much farther than I thought it was when you drive you forget how far things get <laughs> so yeah so and if you can't like once a month it'd be great if you could really I have two friends that when the weather gets better we're going to do a, a, a marathon 26.2 mile walk just walk it and uh, the last time they did it they did it with a steel mace I'm going to do it with very light uh, two pound and actual heavy hand hands. So I'm gonna, the strap will be uh, the hands, the soft part will be here and the strap will be on the back. So I'll be able to relax my hands the whole time. Uh, and you just walk, you eat a big lunch about halfway and you just, that's all you do. That's the whole day. Maybe once a month, once every six weeks or so, go for a long one. Something that really challenges you. Not, not challenges. That's not what I meant. Something that really is like, okay, that was a long walk. But most of the time, you'll find 30 minutes, 45 minutes to be pretty good. And pretty good is pretty high praise. All right? Great question, Ian. Thank you. Oh, we have another question um, uh, from an Ian, maybe the same person, huh? In your recent episode, you said quiet elbows as a cue for the kettlebell clean. This has been a personal revelation and is so incredibly simple. I, I work really hard on making that stuff simple. Stupidly so. Oh, yeah, thank you. And there is lies your genius. It's true. Roll with it. You know, you know, when I was young, uh, I wasn't the best student in the world because I had uh, squirrel. I had uh, my daughter. Uh, she's a school teacher, and she she goes, "Oh yeah, Dad, you have that. You had this condition." So I had a speech impediment. I had this. I didn't have a learning disability, uh, and. Uh, so I don't know if I ever really shined as much as I could as a student. But once I started doing, especially when I got to college, fields that just kept me riveted, I was a pretty good student. So genius is a stretch, but good student I'll take. I'm wondering if you have a short list of cues that apply to a form check of any other number of lists. A cheat sheet of, short, of sorts that uh, of your favorite quick corrections that you share with the masses that are easily digestible and rem remembered would be amazing. Sure, let's just let me just do the kettlebell six, okay, for you. Okay, let's start with the kettlebell snatch. The snatch, in the way I teach it, doesn't start from the swing. I always teach a snatch here. So for me, now obviously for the first one you got to get it up there. So okay, so you're gonna do the snatch test. You can do all hundred. So it's one plus 99. Once you get it here, though, this is when I, how I count the snatch. So you either, you know, you either pour the pitcher out, you unzip the jacket, however you do it. You let the bell go and you attack your zipper. You, you bend and you attack it back up. The key, I think, to getting the snatch test done easily is not swing top down but starting top from the top, throw it down, stab it up, throw it down, stab it up, throw it down, stab, stab it up. 
goblet squat. Yeah, it, you push your elbows out, your knees out with your elbows. That's that's what the goblet squat is. And I know because I'm very good friends with the, the person who invented it. Me. Uh, when it comes to the clean, quiet elbows, that's a big one. Um, the press... This would be the one where I actually kind of have to touch, you know, probably touch you. But the mistake most people make in the press is when they get into that position, and for a lot of people it is the sticking point, you have to have the, well, and I, I explained it in a recent video that, so, you know, you you pretend that this is a, a, a rocket ship and the rocket is, you have to have a vertical form. And what I see a lot of people when they struggle, they go, and then they go, they try to press like that, and I don't know what they're trying to do. But if you have a vertical forearm, and then uh, that that's the big one. But you have to work on it. So with the kettlebell press, you start here. You know, everything's tight. You start to push up. It does force length because of the bell. It's, it works perfectly. It swings out. It, some people call it the J press. Don't worry about it too much. But it comes out to about 45 degree-ish ish from your body. And then you drive it up. It just that J press with the, the this being vertical, the, the forearm perpendicular to the ground. That's where the money is. Um, ah, the swing, uh, hinge plank, hinge plank, hinge plank. So if you don't know how to hinge, don't, don't try to swing. If you don't know how to plank, don't try to swing. Which is why, even though I'm a master kettlebell instructor, both for uh, Dragon Door, the RKC, and uh, Strong First, um, I think I take longer to teach the swing than any person anywhere. I mean, I, I go to these box, they're called boxes, and they got these people in for the first day, and they're having them swing, and it's like, you might as well just <laughs> have them drink some Jack Daniels and drive a car as fast as you can, because you know, this is a traffic accident. And on the Turkish get up, don't think Turkish get up, think Turkish get down. And I always add the press. If you, Just look up my name on YouTube right here. Turkish get down. I think there's three videos on it. I don't know why we have to keep making it, but we do. So uh, so you, st you press here standing. You get into the cross-country ski position. You press. Knee comes down. You press. Windshield wiper, the, the in this case, would be my right leg press. Uh, hand goes to the ground, so now I'm in a kneeling windmill position. I press, uh, I sweep through, tall sit, press to my elbow, press, roll to my back, floor sit, press, grab it with both hands, bring it in, roll to my side safely, put the bell down. If you do Turkish get down presses long enough, and then you, you'll just be amazed how simple the Turkish get back up is. Um... Well, that's kettlebells. And if you want more, Ian, just, you know, ping me and just make sure you tell me what piece of equipment. I got the sense it, you wanted kettlebells, so that's why I did it. That was a fun question, okay? Lawrence uh, asks a question, and it's a tough one. How would you suggest building muscle and strength in the lower body for a 63-year-old? Well, you know, <laughs> uh, it's it's a tough one because I, I've said this a hundred times in this podcast, but um, the two hardest things to do is lose body fat and increase muscle mass. Those are the two hardest things if you're 18 or 28. Uh, increasing body mass, uh, lean body mass uh, at age 63 is 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 just a little bit harder than it was at 23. So. For me, what I would recommend, and uh, I mean, go to the workout generator, Dan John University, and just, you know, put in the equipment you have and just do it. That's number one. You got to be lifting weights. You got to be lifting weights, three sets of eight, three sets of 10, five sets of five, the, the basics, the basics. It's got to be a push. There's got to be a pull. There's got to be a squat. There's got to be a, a hinge. I think you should do loaded carries. Um, that's going to take care of the strength. I guarantee it, unless there's an issue. For the lean body mass, as you get, oh, and then you, when you finish that workout, you go for a walk, and that'll take care of the lean body mass. It's just hard 
And the, the mistake you're going to make, Lawrence, is, um, and this is what usually happens, is people try to, to get all this done in, uh, oh, you know, give it a year. I mean, kind of, kind of what I'm doing with my body composition goals, you know, I'm giving myself an open-ended, I think it, I mean, the goals get down to 211, but I, I didn't say I would do it in a year. I mean, I, I went from 251 to 231 in, in quickly. And then I got from 231 down to 218. And now, uh, I had a little bounce back up because of the holidays and life and, you know, but now I'm, I'm just like, it's no problem. We're, we're, we're trending in the right direction with your strength. You just want to trend in the right direction. And you do that by doing three sets of eight, three sets of five, five sets of five, five sets of three, change switching exercises, coming back with another set of, you know, those, you know. so that's how you can do it. Um, does eating protein before you train help? My friend Tom Faye told me, yeah, absolutely. But he said it's much less than what people think. I mean, I've got those protein drinks upstairs that are 30 grams each, and you, you probably only need a third or half of that for most people um, before you work out uh, or immediately after. I, I guess you could get one of those protein drinks and do half before and half after. Um, one thing we did experiment with my high school athletes that worked freakishly well is they uh, set an alarm clock um, about halfway through the night. Now, you got to be careful at 63 because if you wake up at 63, you might not be able to go back to sleep. So you have to make sure you have good sleep hygiene. Halfway through the night, they would drink half a protein drink. And upon arisal, they would they would uh, drink the rest. So even though it was only... But what was happening is they had that long... You know, they they fasted from protein for a while. Say dinner... We also experimented with uh, protein right before dinner. If it doesn't work for you, it's not going to work. And if it does work for you, it's going to work. But it's a, of all the things I've ever tried, that's the most uh, binary. Um, the protein right before you go to bed. Um, some of my athletes did it. And it was like, Coach, I can't sleep. I can't, I can't sleep when I do it. Oh, okay, okay. And the next one is, it is the single finest thing that I've ever done in my life. There's, there's, It's binary. Um, try it on a... Friday night, the first time you do it, so that you have the weekend to <laughs> do the damage of the silliness. So that's it. I mean, so uh, if you're going to play around with protein, I'd rather you play around with time protein ingestion. Uh, but you got to lift weights. You just, you just have to. I hope that helps, Lawrence. Thank you. We have a question from Nico. Boy, I think we've had questions from Nico before. Nico says, I have a question about kettlebell training. I would love go. I would love to go back to using the kettlebell, but I'm concerned I might injure myself. Any advice on how to start training with kettlebells? With what movement should I learn first and how should I improve? Well, Nico, I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter what piece of equipment you're using. If you don't know how to properly hinge, you don't know how to properly squat, um, you don't understand the basics of, you know, holding onto the ground with your feet, uh, don't do anything. Um, the best thing I think you can do is find someone who knows kettlebells. Um, sign up for a session, uh, come to one of my workshops, whatever, and get it done, uh, learn. Uh, I teach uh, with Dragon Door at the RKC. Find out, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing some workshops uh, this year. Um, find out where I am and, and take... Take it, maybe take the HKC, the hard style kettlebell course, where you learn the goblet squat, the swing, and the Turkish get up. It's just not that, uh, it's not much of an investment, doesn't take very much time, but it may be really, really worth your, your, your time and effort. I got to tell you, folks, it's going to be a high bar uh, to. Uh, get better than the questions we had this week. I, I really enjoyed them. Uh, the questions were so good. I talked to my daughters about things, uh, about some of the questions. I, I've talked to a couple people about things. So that that's exciting for me. So I really appreciate the, the great insights from our questioners this week. Remember, if you have questions, uh, no one ever sticks around for this part, so I just wait, I'm just wasting my time here. Podcast at 
danjohnuniversity.com. I'm here to answer questions. I'm always glad to do it. And uh, if they're this good of questions, it makes my life much easier. So, hey, and you know, until next time, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you. I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com.